Hello and welcome back to Let's Play Wrath of the Righteous with me, Bring It Don. We're gonna see if we can figure out this puzzle. Go oh, we're actually gonna use Ivu for it, I think. I saw these single slabs, I only have one option, just like the previous puzzle it looks like. Pretty straightforward. Now the previous puzzle had it so that I think the outside ones were adjacent and then inside they were opposites. I might be misremembering. I can put down whatever I want. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to put down... I assume this is supposed to be a reflected pattern, right? So I'm going to put down the Eye of Horus here. Uh, let's see. I have no idea which one to put down first. <laughs> we'll go with the double just to be safe. Alright, so now the game should direct me. Okay, according to this, looks like it has to be adjacent. It needs to be adjacent. This one needs to be the Eye of Horus, and this one needs to be the Eye of Horus. Where's that scythe coming to play then? Maybe this one needs to be the Eye of Horus and the scythe. It should be either. Okay, we have two of those. How do I know which one of these it needs to go here? I guess it's just trial and error for the most part, isn't it? Unless you put one down right there. And these probably don't matter, right? Alright, probably don't use that yet. We need one of these right here. Uh, let's see. Well, we know this one has to be one of these. Sure, we're just gonna put that down right there. See where that takes us. Um, yeah, I have no idea. Just trial and error it a bit. It's too hard to see these things, so. I am partially just winging it to see what happens. Alright, so this one needs to be the tic-tac-toe and the scythe. Is the right scythe? No. We need this one over here. Okay, I see. I see. Oh, no, it's a uh, horse. Uh, that's not the right one. Oh, that one's the wrong one. Okay, I see. This one needs to move. Over here. There we go. Oh cool, okay, we solved it. Haha. <laughs> Wasn't too bad. So yeah, just adjacencies. Um I'm not sure what this pattern is just to indicate, I guess. Oh no, I guess that is accurate, isn't it? No. Yeah, this pattern is useless because you go I have horse, then another I have horse. Which isn't what this pattern reflects, and then it goes to the scythe. Like why is this symbol here? Because you don't do I get it if you, for each symbol you go double, so it's two Eye of Horuses and then two uh, of the Scythe symbols. But then this isn't used. I felt, ugh, that's so weird. But yeah, then it just adjacent symbols, that's not so bad. Okay. 
Again, the hardest part is seeing the symbols. But luckily, the game kind of shoehorns you in the right direction because it. You only have so many options when it goes to place them down. It's just the first one. Figuring out which one goes down first is the is the hard part. Once you figure that out, it's, it's not so bad. All right, well, that didn't take nearly as much time as I was expecting it to. So, um, hmm. Uh, I guess we can get back to Dresden. We do have another Elven note for the storyteller. We can turn that into him. We've also picked up a couple resources to potentially reforge one of the magic items that uh, he can make for us, so we can probably head back and see if we can do one of those as well. We also have these armies approaching. Hmm. All right, storyteller, divulge your secrets. Uh, first, we'll swing by the merchant, see if we have stuff to sell. With that flaming star knife, plus three. Wait, when did we get this? These gloves have claws that deal 1 to 8 slashing damage on an armed attack. The enemy has evil alignment, they deal 2 to 6 damage instead. In addition, these claws give the wearer a plus 1 enhancement bonus on attack and damage rolls. Um, hello there, Lan. Unless I misread that, those are really, really good on Lan. Let me double check before I go just slapping this on him though. Yo, 1 to 8 slash damage on an armed attack, which he does. 2 to 6 instead if they're evil. Yeah, holy crap, these are fantastic. When did we pick those up? <laughs> I don't remember picking those up at all. And she gets that. Alright, well, fantastic. Did I pick those up this episode? Nope, have no idea where this came from. Alright, hand over the bloodstained page. I found it in the molten scar. The sword teller cringes and puts his hand on the bloodstained page. His face contorts into a painful grimace, his voice trembling with terror. No, he's here again. That terrible grating voice. Terrific semblance of a face. The monstrous appearance. Myriad insects forming a body with two arms and two legs. He touches me, and the disgusting creatures attack my flesh, covering me. They're eating me. They're hungry and will devour everything except my eyes and tongue, so that I can see this darn page. So that I can translate the runes written in the ancient, long-forgotten elven language. And I translate. It hurts so much. I tried to lie to him. I changed the translation. But he saw through my lie. He got angry. Now I'm not lying. I'm not. He takes one of the insects from my face, and squishes it with his fingers over the inkwell. Then he dips the quill in it and writes with my blood right over the runes. And I continue to dictate. Glastria, when will this be over? Let me die. Xanthir, let me die. The storyteller jerks his hand back. The storyteller jerks back his hand terrified. Oh gods, such horrible torture. This poor man was tortured to decrypt my notes. He was so tormented that his suffering became thick like molasses. My mind is drowning in it. My own memories are hidden by these images of horror. I can try to get through to them, but I will need your help. Tell me everything you've seen and heard. 
I'll try to lean on your words. To use them as light in the darkness of my forgotten past. Storyteller takes the bloodstained page carefully, as they're handling a dangerous insect. I see a magic shape. There is a force pulsating in the center. You've seen the ritual. Tell me, what was its central point? Its magic knot. A dead man. They killed a crusader and conducted the ritual over his corpse. The storyteller frowns. A dead man. I don't understand. I feel something else. A life. A living soul in the eye of the whirlwind. I don't understand how one ritual can tie up the energies of death and the abyss. The currents in the world's ephemera are contradirectional. The storyteller sighs weakly. Forgive me, commander. I cannot get any further. Everything is vague and unclear, and the screams of the poor lad keep ringing my ears. Did I give him the wrong answer? Well, I found a page that might interest you. The storyteller carefully takes your find. Yes, you were right. Another piece of evidence from the past I have forgotten. The old elf's expression becomes withdrawn. Alright, we've already read all that. Okay, we can restore the ring. I give the storyteller the ring fragment and the necessary materials. I restore this relic for me. The storyteller sets the ring fragment and the bars of metal on his open palm. He clenches his fist, crumpling the metal like paper, and pours the essence from the vials over it. You feel terrible heat rising from the elf's hand. When he opens his fingers, you see a beautiful ring. A remarkable object, this. It was created by a talented spellcaster and is able to summon beings from other planes, as if the boundaries set by Phrasma do not exist for it. It is a powerful and dangerous item, but it was created by an honorable person. That is probably why it was not used at the crucial hour. There is quiet sadness in the storyteller's voice. Ring of Summoning. Whoops. As soon as you touch the relic, a vision comes over you. You witness the events as if you lived through them yourself. Together we can put an end to the tyrannical rule over us. Let them accept us and see us as people. If they try to subdue us by force as before. Let them prepare to feel our, our pushback. We'll force them to overturn their meaningless, superstitious ban on arcane magic. We'll make them see us as people, not as evil witches. We'll destroy the cursed prison of Threshold and set free the innocents within, doomed to wretched and unjust imprisonment. We will save Star Chorus, but only together. I therefore urge anyone and everyone for whom freedom is worth rebelling and fighting for, join our alliance. Your brother in magic, Opon. Another letter, so we found, I think, that exact same letter in a Relo's laboratory. Another letter is ready. I seal it with wax and leave the imprint of my signet ring in the soft scarlet substance. There's no need to hide when reaching out to comrades. My fingers cramp up, tired of holding the quill that is rewritten over and over the same letter for what seems like the hundredth time this morning. Clearly, I need a break. I twist the ring of summoning on my finger, and a proud bird appears before me, its feathers gleaming with gold. The summoned bird waits patiently while I tie the letter to its leg, and it flies out the window. Yet another messenger dispatched. This bird, like so many others, will fly over Sarkoris to find a fellow practitioner of the arcane arts. Together, we can bring about a revolution. We simply must unite our efforts. It is time to change our country, to overthrow the dictatorship oppressing us, to cast off the terror that has enveloped us, not the ruthless hunting of innocence. I leave my study and look into the guest room. The poor souls are sound asleep. A boy and a girl, both spellcasters, outlaws, and criminals like me. They were on the run for three months until I offered them shelter here. They'll be hungry when they wake up. I need to get some bread and dried fish. And outside, spring awaits. The smell of flowers creeps in to tickle my nose playfully. The sun smiles, eager to embrace me with its light, and the soft wind slyly kisses my cheeks, whispering in my ear. It's going to be all right. A winter is behind us, and the glorious, well-fed, and hard-working city of eyes welcomes spring. I love my city. I love the people who live here. Nowhere else have I met such selfless and heartfelt people, people of coming to their neighbor's aid, of welcoming a stranger into their home and seating them by the hearth. Uh, they are the best people in the whole world, until they get scared. Oh my good eyes, how can you be so indifferent to the injustice reigning in Sarkoris? 
I'm getting emotional. Really, my heart is soft and urges rebellion. Only uneasily find a home within me. Oh, and urges of rebellion. I see a girl sitting in an alleyway, shedding tears of her broken doll. I pass her by and glance back cautiously. She's sitting alone. No one else is around. The mark of her cartwheel scars her doll's mangled torso. It is, it is beyond repair. I approach the girl carefully, take a seat, and smile at the child. She looks at me warily, but without fear. I look around again. Still, no one is nearby. All right. I turn the signet on my finger, and the air above the sidewalk twists into the form of a tiny man made of whirlwinds. The garbage around him flies up in the air as the magic man starts moving, bowing dramatically, and grabs the doll and dances with it. And the tears on the girl's cheeks dry instantly, replaced with laughter and joy. Then I hurry away. And the tiny elemental will give the little one another minute or two of happiness, and then it will fade away. My act of kindness is a stupid risk, but that's what we're fighting for. For freedom, for children's laughter, for the feeling in our hearts that we've done everything right in a good conscience. All right, before I read the rest, I'm going to speculate that girl's going to get caught with the uh, elemental and she's going to be burned or killed, whatever the Sarkorians do to arcane practitioners. So, a rumble and noise. The voices are loud and unkind, so scary that my dream dissolves instantly scaring away like a frightened animal. Stomping on the stairs, fists drumming on the door, I know these sounds. It's the sound of a night of rest, the sound of people entering a home to drag away an innocent into the night. I run to the next room, growling. We're leaving, but it's too late. The door swings open, and behind it there is a man with a huge black wolf at his feet. Setri Dev Devimai, suppressor of the voices of freedom. The scum who suffocated his own conscience while I was still in the crib. Glad I took in throws himself at the brute, yelling, Run, Sir Opon. A brave kid indeed. But where can I run? Torches and spears flank the windows, while the soul taker and his henchmen bar the door. They stand there, swords drawn, demanding my surrender. The boys are already crumpled up and lying in the corner, fed in half from the blow that the scoundrel of that scoundrel Setri's faith fist. The wolf snarls, foam dripping from its maw. Surrender. Bad chance, you scum. I never make it out of here alive, but I'll not soon forget Sir, Sir Opon. I turn the signet on my finger, ready to set a dozen soul eaters loose. Yet I pause as a familiar face flashes in the doorway. A crying girl next to a pale man and woman, surely her parents. They brought her to identify me, to ensure that I wouldn't escape the hunt through some trickery. What scoundrels? I will... I will what? What can I do? My beloved eye stretches out before my eyes. How many houses are there around me? How many families? How many people are sleeping in their beds right now? They're kind people, albeit unfairly cruel to us. Are you willing to bring monsters down on your city, Opon? On your neighbors? Would you watch them die screaming and choking, fighting for breath? Would you watch your, your monsters rip the very souls out of their children? You have so much hate in you, Opon. Are you really a malevolent witch? A monster, as they claim. I'm shaken, so someone has walked on my grave. I stand there shivering, afraid of myself as time slips away. The black wolf leaps forward, as he's sinking to my hand. My finger is bitten off entirely, disappeared down his throat, while the ring of summoning groans, crushed by horrific jaws. I throw myself onto the floor and roll around, screaming and thrashing about, as if it helps. The brutes drag me to my feet and punch me in the stomach. My, an my hand hurts, as if the darn wolf were still chewing on it. For all my hopes and good intentions, this is my fate. The screen grants the wearer the ability to summon either Axiomites or Soul Eaters, randomly selected once per day, that they were summoned by a Summon Monster 8 spell. All allies, including the wearer within 30 feet, gain a plus 2 bonus to weapon damage rolls and plus 2 bonus on saving throws against attacks made or effects created by chaotic creatures. Seems really good. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he does not need that, so there you go, buddy. Alright, well, let's go rest. Then we'll set out once again. Um, we have to continue moving our one army up north to intercept the demon army. It's beaten down our fort. It's, uh, fort's gates, there we go.
You're approached by a procession of ornate chests flashing predatory grins. Hey, Commander. How are we doing today? They didn't want to let us in to see you at first. We're mimics. The lot of us. A lot of fun we are, too. We can turn into a chair, and then when an enemy sits on us, we'll grab him on the rump. Om nom nom. <laughs> we heard about a new commander from the Crusaders. A cheerful sort with a good head on his shoulders. So we figured we'd join you and be knighted. You know, like the rest of those free crusaders of yours. I didn't realize that mimics could talk. I, mean, I guess if they can change shape, they can morph their mouth into a mouth they can speak. If I've ever been truly horror struck over these last thousand years or thousand or so years, I can't recall. But I certainly am now. Why do you even want to join the crusade? Why? Everybody's joining, so we figured we'd join too. I mean, if you could turn wood into knights, and kids into knights, then why not us, huh? Why not us, huh? Didn't enunciate there at all. Gobbling up demons and cultists might even be more fun. We could transform into an altar of Baphomet, wait for a cultist to come up close and start preaching, and then om nom nom. Well, perfect. Consider yourselves enlisted. I dub the Sir Wardrobe, Sir Footstool, and Sir Cultist's Bed. Now we're talking. Look, we're crusaders now, my lads. And demons had better beware. <laughs> Can't believe we have mimics. Alright, let's go rest up. Can I believe Marvok was serious when he said he loved that vicious beetle from the abyss? Did he, she have switched or bewitched him somehow? The stupidity, depravity, and suggestibility of humans I know no bounds. Sometimes no magic is needed to drive a person to such madness. Well, he knew he's being duped, but he may not have known what Jerabeth looked like. Follow my lead. But, I mean, even if he ever found out what she looked like, it's possible by that point he just kind of, um... He realized he was too far to go back and she was the only person that would accept him. But did they get past my fort? No. What? Oh, he probably went down the south path. Okay. Well, Dresden's about to be under attack. Hi, right, invitation from the Free Crusaders. Uh, the Free Crusaders have sent a letter to the Citadel inviting the Crusade leader to pay them a visit at his court. Okay, we'll deal with that. Fate of the Dirty Squealer. A wizard with a dark past and fearsome reputation claims to be familiar with the rituals of the Omexes, who serve the Demon Lord Jubilex. Who extract a Crimson Shard of Mica to replace the Eye of Mud Golem of a Mud Golem captured in battle and placed on the commander's gear. If all goes well. The power hidden in the stone will flow into the item onto which it is placed. It is necessary to decide what kind of item it will be. I will do an amulet. I'm pretty happy with most of my belts. Alright, the mage has carried out his task. Fantastic. Okay, so I just keep hiring Azadas if I want to. Let's do this first, because we found this ages ago. The fate of chores hide and tusks. Uh, let's go ahead and upgrade one of my outposts to a bastion. So by upgrading an outpost to a bastion, the commander will expand its territory for buildings as well as allow the construction of advanced structures there. Senior comrades, uh, Sila will select the most valiant and responsible warriors that will keep their comrades' morale in check and seek out any signs of treason or doubt. Right, the walls of Dresden have been fortified. Probably would focus on ranking up my stuff instead. Oh well. I get a little hasty when it comes to issuing decrees. I get decree happy and just start slinging them out. Alright. Well, they want to talk to us at the court. As it should I always be. want to talk. Can they do anything by themselves?
Like, I'm, I'm the commander. I'm not a babysitter. Get you guys further up here. I need to get you all the way back to Dresden, it looks like. Let's build a few more things real fast. Um, let's see. Oh, we did finish here. We... Okay, good. Uh, so, Alchemist Laboratory. Here's some barracks, and that's it for now. Alright, we're gonna go to Freedom's View. Strong wrong, you're in luck. I was about to take you to the commander. Don Quixote is already here. Don Quixote, you have a very special guest. Ronco likes the Orient standing next to her with admiration. She's obviously marveling at the stoic and rugged face of the majestic giant. Allow me to introduce you to Strong Rung, the Orient people's emissary. The Orient bows with unexpected grace, body making a low grinding noise. Esteemed Don Quixote, I'm honored to speak on behalf of all Orients. The Orient elders and sages learn of a champion bringing life back to the defiled and corrupted territories of the north. Our leaders secluded themselves in meditation, later holding council. Might be a comma? Uh, such massive gatherings are uncommon for our people. It only happen because of important reasons. The Orients have decreed that we ought to help you. We are the children of this earth, and you are its champion, so we should join forces and fight together. But then the sages from Jamare began to argue with the enlightened priests of Osirian over who is more worthy to lead the United Army. My impulsive brethren from Janderhof presumed to do it themselves, gravely offending both other parties in the in the process. The disagreement was fierce. In the end, you always decided it falls to you to decide who you wish to see as your allies. Ronco, early sunset, what do you advise? I've never seen a real Orient monk from Jalmare. There are so many fantastic stories about them. Of course we should ask them for help so I can get to... well, never mind. What I'm trying to say is that they will surely come in handy. I consider any help valuable and like to pay my respects to any Orient willing to aid us. Having said that, I feel that the Orients of Janderhof, who live next to the Dwarves, would feel closer to the Crusaders and be easier for them to understand than the other members of the other members of this people. Uh, we have already assembled plenty of diverse volunteers who seek to defend Glorian. Perhaps we shouldn't push our luck by continuing to invite ever increasingly in exotic allies. Is he supposed to be an Azada? He's a very tame Azada. That's uh, a strong wrong. I wish to know more about your people. Strong wrong offers you a respectful nod. Many of us live on the island of Jalmare. My brethren dwell in highland monasteries where they study the wisdom of Rory and Nethys, achieve enlightenment, and become great contemplators of existence. But those who anger us risk finding out why everyone is afraid of the Oread's fury. Another large settlement of my people is located in Arsarian. They are born from camps and sandstorms, a majestic and terrifying tempest that can bury a city in a single night. The Kamsin or Kamsin are caused by fierce spiritual battles between elementals. The Oreads of that land possess a far starker and cruel wisdom than John Murray monks. They're, they worship Osarian gods and are powerful defenders of their homeland. The nearest large settlement is located in Janderhof, Barissia's largest dwarven city. I hail from there. 
The raids of Janderhof are closely bound to the dwarves. We have adopted many of their crafts, customs, and traditions. Among our kinsmen, we are considered to be hasty and adventurous. What a surprise. There are people in this world who believe associating with dwarves can turn into a rash adventurer. Rocka laughs loudly. Not a strong run. Any wise ones agree? The Oriad hesitates before answering. Our people do business slightly less hastily than other mortals. We live and think in a different rhythm, more solid and deliberate. In your world, this argument would be little more than a squabble between old friends, inevitably resolved and quickly forgotten. But I fear time is too precious for you to wait for our reconciliation. It's always sad to see how freedom of thought can lead to divisions. Of course, we are not going to condemn foreign traditions and other people's ways of life. We regret not being able to receive all the help that the Oriads could provide because of a temporary quarrel. That's a lot of hit points. 446. I didn't look at the damage here. I assume they get spells, right? I don't see a list of spells. Um. Oh wait, I saw it. Curse of the Black Sands. On Ferris Curse. Yeah, let's get the uh, let's get the sand clerics. I'll summon reinforcements from Osirian. Stormwind bows in a gallant manner. I'll pass along your words to the elders. The chosen army will immediately move out. You don't have to worry about them arriving late. We may be slow to decide. Once we've made a decision, we tarry not. The Oriads are marching to war. Neat. I guess where the uh, mimics be at. That is not far. I don't know what all these objects what they're highlighted for. Always be ready for the worst. A gingerbread demon created by the Calvary Sculptors. The statue looks as though... It's partly molded by hand. Probably chiseled at full gallop. The Young Crusader. Yeah, I don't see the mimics up here at all. Mistakes. The trance grove has developed surprisingly fast. Quartz magic must have something to do with it. All right, I'll go ahead. We can go ahead and leave here. Start heading back south. Hopefully, get our army up here to defend Resin before it falls. Travel until we can move the army. Then we're going to move our army to defend Dresden. Then we're going to call it an episode. Oh, is it attacking? Oh, it's actually attacking the city. Oh, no, I have an army here. Kind of. Just some Orient monks. Oh, I didn't mean to skip my turn. Well. It was nice having him in the party while it lasted. <laughs> I 
or not in the party, but as part of the army. All right. Why couldn't my other army fight that army instead of the one they ended up fighting? <laughs> Like, I think it's two armies now that I think the army that died over here would have succeeded against. Alright, but we should be able to reach there. I think it's only been, what, a turn? Maybe two since it started sieging the fort. So we get there next turn and it should be safe. Alright, we're going to call the episode here. And the next one we'll head down, uh, I guess, to the Heart of Mystery. See what's going on there. And then we'll just keep working our way south. Uh, the Burned Down Shack, the Found Barrows, and so on and so forth. Knapsack on a tree. <laughs> yeah, this army's in here by itself. This, I think it's one of those like mini boss armies. Not gonna worry about that quite yet. By the way, I'm gonna call it here. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one.